Cynthia Tucker needs very little introduction in the city of Atlanta, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize as an editorial page editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. She was a Washington political columnist, syndicated columnist, and a frequent commentator on radio and TV. But this is actually her first book, as she was telling me backstage, so we're really happy that she's here tonight. Um, she's won numerous awards and honors, and she's also uh, taught at the UGA Grady School of Journalism and journalist in residence at the University of South Alabama. Her co-author for this book is Fry Gilliard. He is an award-winning journalist and the author of more than 30 books on Southern history and culture. Um, his A Hard Rain was named one of NPR's best books in 2018, and he is also the winner of numerous book awards and prizes. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Cynthia and Fry. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. We're delighted to be here with you this evening. I see so many familiar faces. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the genesis of the book, and then Fry will read an excerpt. In 1974, the brilliant Southern journalist John Edgerton wrote a series of essays about the ways in which the South was changing. As Edgerton saw it, the South was becoming less isolated from the rest of the country. With the creation of so many interstate highways, with the spread of television, and now the South is even less isolated with the spread of the internet and so much migration. Edgerton believed that the North and the South were not so much exchanging strengths as exchanging sins. He was a bit of a pessimist. He talked about the ways in which the South was becoming so much more materialistic and consumerist with shopping malls everywhere. But he also noticed that when George Wallace ran for president in 1968, many Midwesterners and Northeasterners were pleased to embrace his explicit racism. Not that there hadn't always been racism in other parts of the country, but Wallace's presidency brought home the ways in which so many people outside the South were willing to embrace a figure like Wallace. Randall Williams, who is editor at a small publishing house called New South Books, Ask Fry if he didn't have about 20,000 words or so as a follow-up, uh, a look at the South and the rest of the nation some 50 years later. Fry said, I think I've got at least that many. And Fry asked me to join the project, and I was honored to do so. So we, too, have written a series of essays about the ways in which the South and the rest of the nation are exchanging strengths in some cases, but also, unfortunately, exchanging sins. We start in the 1970s talking about um, Jimmy Carter winning uh, governorship of Georgia, Reuben Askew being elected governor of Florida, that was a time when it seemed as though the South was moving in the right direction. Both of these men understood the harm of racism and wanted the South to move beyond that. And they campaigned on that. And they were elected. We move on to uh, talk about the civil rights leaders who worked in the movement after King's death and those who took up politics, including Andy Young, 
who was a congressman, later UN ambassador, and later mayor of, it, of Atlanta. We also talk about the late, great John Lewis, who did so much to advance this nation along the path to a more perfect union. Um, and then somewhere, somehow, Donald Trump got elected, embracing uh, enthusiastically the rhetoric of George Wallace. He didn't, um, happily, he didn't stay in office. He didn't win a second term. But Trumpism is alive and well. There were still signs of hope in the South. Uh, many of those signs were right here in Georgia, where Georgians had the good sense to elect the first black US senator from the state, Raphael Warnock, and John Ossoff, um, I believe, is also the first Jewish senator from the state of Georgia. We, Fry and I, were both thrilled to see that they sometimes campaign together, which called to mind the old civil rights alliance between uh, black civil rights leaders and Jewish leaders. Um, I won't talk right now about how the book ends. If you've read it, you already know. But we will talk more about that later. And Fry is going to read an excerpt now. Thank you, Cynthia. We, um, we were asked, um, and both of us were very happy about this, we were asked to do an excerpt from the book uh, for the newspaper, The Guardian, which is one of my favorite papers. And, um, and so I'm going to read from that. Uh, it kind of is an amalgam of several parts of the book, but, um, and some of it just emphasizes some of the points that Cynthia was just making. In 1974, the great Southern journalist John Edgerton wrote a prescient book entitled The Americanization of Dixie, the Southernization of America. In a series of connected but self-contained essays, he made the point that something fundamental was changing, both in his native South and in the country as a whole. But even Edgerton seemed not to be sure exactly how things would unfold. He was, as those of us who knew him could attest, one of the great and gentle souls of his time, a man deeply committed to racial justice who wanted badly to believe that it would be a good thing if this troubled place in which he lived, this part of America that had once fought a war for the right to own slaves, could emerge from the strife of the civil rights years somehow chastened and wiser for the journey, if it could narrow its distance from the rest of the country and perhaps even lead it toward better days. That was the hope. But Edgerton, as was his habit, saw darker possibilities as well. Giving voice to his fears, he wrote, the South and the nation are not exchanging strengths as much as they're exchanging sins. More often than not, they are sharing and spreading the worst in each other while the best languishes and withers. For a while, it was easy enough to make the case that Edgerton's gloom was misplaced, or at least overstated. The anecdotal evidence was all around. In Virginia, Republican Governor Linwood Holton had stunned political observers when he was elected in 1969 on a promise of racial reconciliation. In contrast to the Southern Democrats who had controlled Virginia for 100 years, Holton proclaimed that the era of defiance, of resistance to civil rights progress was coming to an end. He supported school desegregation, appointed women and minorities to state government, and promised to make Virginia a model in race relations. In Florida, new Democratic Governor Reuben Askew sounded nearly identical themes and set such a standard for integrity and competence that Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government rated him one of the top 10 governors of the 20th century. And of course, there was Jimmy Carter, Elected governor of Georgia in 1970,
Carter proclaimed in his inaugural address that the time for racial discrimination is over. Easily the most ambitious of these New South champions, he soon set out for the presidency with southernness at the heart of his appeal. I've been the product of an emerging South, he said. I see the clear advantages of throwing off the millstone of racial prejudice. I think it's a, proce it's a process that's compatible with the moral and ethical standards of our nation. The heritage of our country is envisioned by our forefathers. I also see that we have a special responsibility here. When we are meek or quiescent or silent on the subject of civil rights at home or human rights abroad, there is no other voice on earth that can replace the lost voice, the absent voice of the United States. This is what the persecutors want. This is what the persecuted fear. For many Americans, it was mesmerizing. A peanut farmer from the deepest south reconnecting the country with its finest ideals. In 1976, when Carter won the Democratic nomination, he stood side by side at the National Convention, gazing out across the sea of, of delegates with Martin Luther King Sr. There they were, two native Georgians, one black, one white, a Southern governor and a civil rights lion, sharing a moment that felt like a revival, not only of the faith they both proclaimed, but of a dream deferred, of shining hopes and possibilities in which so many of us wanted to believe. Surely the Lord shouted Daddy King over the mad cacophony of music and cheers amid descending balloons is in this place. There was intoxication in the moment, but we knew it was shadowed by something very different, the realities John Edgerton was writing about. In the presidential election of 1968, Richard Nixon had embarked on a Southern strategy and he did not mean the things that Jimmy Carter was telling us. In a sense, Nixon's mentor had been George Wallace. He watched in private admiration as the Alabama governor who had pledged in, his 19, in 1963 his commitment to segregation forever, learned to redefine his, appe his appeal. In the presidential primaries of 1964 and 68, Wallace spoke more obliquely about race almost as if he were teaching the nation how to think in code. From the time he famously stood in the schoolhouse door, he had begun to polish that skill. Everybody understood in the summer of 1963 the mission at hand, how Wallace was embarked on a doomed quixotic quest to block the admission of black students Vivian Malone and James Hood to the University of Alabama. But just as secessionists 100 years earlier had talked about states' rights when they really meant slavery, Wallace cast the federal government as a bully, an outside force pursuing integration without regard to the will of the people, and he cast himself as a noble defender of freedom. A few years later on the campaign trail for the presidency, he found it useful not to mention segregation, but to talk about liberal sob sisters or bleeding heart sociologists, or some bearded Washington bureaucrat who can't even park his bicycle straight. All the shared resentments were there, but he and his audience felt shielded from the charge, his accusers frustrated as they attempted to make it, that they were bigots at heart. There were times when he couldn't contain himself. Once in 1968, he invoked the specter of urban riots, those moments when African-American rage, often in response to pol police brutality, erupted into violence, became in a sense a magnified reflection of the crime. We don't have riots down in Alabama, Wallace roared, bantamweight defiance flashing in his eyes. They start a riot down there, first one of them pick up a brick, gets a bullet to the brain. And then you walk over to the next one and say, all right, pick up a brick. We just want to see you pick up one of them bricks now. Newsman Douglas Kiker of NBC, observing the response of a Midwestern crowd, was struck by a sudden horrifying epiphany. They all hate black people, all of them. They're all afraid. Great God, that's it. They're all Southern. The whole United States is Southern. 
There were African-American activists, people like James Baldwin or Malcolm X, who begged to differ. Both had written with urgency about the indigenous racism of the North. But if the story was more complicated, if racism had already taken root in every nook and corner of America, was there nevertheless something in Kiker's moment of revelation? In this era of homogenization, when television and interstate highways, and soon enough the internet, were erasing the isolation of the South, pulling it into the national mainstream, was there something about our place that was beginning to reshape the country? And if there was, might it be a source of mystical promise, or was it more inevitably a reality overflowing with dread? So that's the question that we pose in the book. And we kind of try to say that it is a question that, that Southern leaders have implicitly, if not sometimes not even deliberately, posed to the country ever since its founding. Thomas Jefferson wrote the words of the Declaration of Independence. Um, he talked about all men being created equal. And those words have been a kind of north star for the growth of American democracy, for the fact that it can and has at times become more inclusive, but with a kind of ebb and flow about that process. And yet the author of those stirring words that we would like to believe we live by was a man, obviously, who enslaved other human beings. So that's been the kind of yin and yang of the South. That's been the, that's, that's been the, the, the sort of parallel currents in the American character uh, ever since the very beginning, uh, we argue. And we, we trace that some in the book. We talk a lot about the uh, years since the 1970s and come forward uh, through the January 6th attack and all of that, but there are flashbacks in the book, too, uh, to, uh, to foreshadowings of some of the darker things that have happened uh, in our own time. Uh, for example, in a part of the book where we wrote about the family separation policy on our southern border, where brown-skinned children were taken from their parents who were seeking asylum in, this, in the United States. Uh, and it was done deliberately as a, um, uh, as a policy of deterrence. And one of the people who was a primary architect of that policy was one of my home senators and Cynthia's home senators from the state of Alabama, Jeff Sessions, who by that time was Attorney General of the United States. And that was an elementally horrifying thing to many people, to see these children crying for their mothers and fathers as they were separated because their parents were trying to escape some kind of danger or seek a better life in this country. But we point out that if you go not too far from here, a couple of hours to the west, uh, to Montgomery, Alabama, to the Equal Justice Initiative Museum, when you go in that museum, one of the very first exhibits you see is a panel of quotes from a black man who was being sold in the warehouse uh, where the museum was established. And this man, his words were recalling not simply the humiliation and the shame of his own experience, but having seen um, an enslaved woman being separated from her seven children. And he remembered the wo woman saying to him, they took them all. Why don't God just kill me? And so we realize that there are these painful precedents in our history scattered all through it. And yet there are those flashes of hope in our history scattered all through it. During Reconstruction, the first black men, and it was all men in those days, to serve in the US Congress often had a kind of Mel Nelson Mandela sensibility. They were people who wanted equal rights, all the civic 
affirmations of the humanity that had been denied them by slavery, but they also didn't want their white neighbors punished for fighting for the Confederacy. There was this kind of forgiving spirit and this kind of grace that was there, and we see that modeled again and again and again. Uh, and so the question we raise in the book, and one maybe you and I will, can discuss now for a minute, um, is, is will we turn away once again from that promise? Um, and the evidence is mixed, we say. Very much so, and I want to um, point out just a moment, since Fry was just talking about um, echoes of, of the past um, cropping up over and over again, there is throughout um, le state legislatures dominated by conservatives and school boards at the moment a movement to call from classrooms the teaching of what opponents call critical race theory. Now my argument is that most of the people talking about critical race theory have no idea what it is actually because critical race theory is not being, certainly not being taught in elementary schools and I don't think it's being taught in any high schools. It is a college level course, sometimes introduced in law schools. But what these opponents of CRT, as they call it, are actually trying to do is whitewash, no pun intended, the history of the United States so that students are not taught the history as it actually was. If you read about the controversies in the classrooms and the books that are being banned, what you find the legislators are after are in many cases books about black history. Since this is a full-fledged culture war, there are also uh, opponents of books that introduce to children something they already know, uh, that families come in all different sizes and shapes and formations, um, and that there are books for young children about gender identity as well. But what it reminds me of is that when I was in the fourth grade, going to segregated schools in Monroeville, Alabama, and reading from hand-me-down textbooks. My fourth grade textbook, No Alabama, was co-authored by a man who wrote that slaves were happy. Um, and that they understood that they're, you know, they love farming, it's called farming. Um, they love farming. And so happily for me, there's not much good that could be said about uh, segregated classrooms. But the good news was my teachers just ignored all that nonsense. But it was in the textbooks. And so that too is an echo of the times we are currently in. It's an echo of all of the incredibly um, all of the incredible energy that was put into lost cause mythology. Um, again, when I was growing up, and even now, uh, you can go to the Monroe County Courthouse, and there's nothing unusual about that. Courthouses dotted throughout the South have monuments to Confederate officers traitors to their country who were held up as heroes. There, are all, there have been monuments to them in the U.S. Capitol. Army bases named for them. And when I first moved to Atlanta, there was a street in the neighborhood I moved into named for Nathan Bedford Forrest, founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Ku Klux Klan. 
So what I see now in this so-called CRT, anti-CRT movement is an effort to go back to that time when children were not taught history as it really was. I, um, the governor of Mississippi recently um, recorded a video in which he swore that in classrooms, white children are being dragged to the front and made to apologize for being oppressors. Now, he could not name a single classroom where that's taking place because it's simply not true. But I see in that movement an echo of lost cause mythology. So some of what we're seeing now has precedence in what happened before. One of the things I'd like to add to what you were just saying there, and what I would say to the governor of Mississippi and what I've said to other people, and I, well, quick little backstory. I've written a couple of children's books about, uh, about these kinds of subjects. And I, so I've had occasion to go into elementary schools and talk to kids and sometimes middle schools. Um, and it, it, it just isn't true that white kids, when they, uh, when they start discussing the fact that people were once enslaved, start to feel bad about being white. And one reason for that is that the history is so much more than just the story of oppression. Uh, there's, there, oppression is absolutely real, and the oppression of black Americans is the great original sin, the great stain on the, on the heart of this country. All of that is absolutely true, but if you look at that history also, it is also a powerful story of aspiration, of hope, uh, just even it, when it's hard to hope. And kids don't see those qualities of character as being racial. They don't see them as being the sole property of white or black. Um, they identify, because they want to identify, with these qualities of character and strength and determination. Um, and in some cases, they're, uh, they're, they're, the story, they're the stories that would get lost if we sanitized our history uh, of, of white people trying to do the right thing because that's a thread that runs its way through our history also. So what we're talking about and what we're pushing back on uh, is the need for an honest appraisal of the pain and the injustice and all of those things, um, but in the context of the larger American story of hope, of things gradually um, becoming more inclusive, of, of the country becoming large enough in its democratic ideals that it can include women or people of color or people who are gay or whatever, uh, or, or whatever it might be. That's one storyline in America. Um, and so we're arguing that that basic storyline needs to be something that all of us understand, but certainly our young people. And, and so the question then still becomes, will that storyline continue to unfold? And I think that's the reason for our subtitle, a story of democracy in the balance, because the racism of our country is so fundamentally undemocratic, you know. Um, Senator Warnock once said that democracy is uh, sort of the, uh, the civic affirmation of the Judeo-Christian ideal that we are all children of God and precious in his sight. So if we're all full citizens with the right to vote, that's our civic affirmation uh, of the larger possibilities of human nature. Um, you know, those kind of ideals are still with us. Uh, if you saw Senator Warnock's maiden speech on the floor of the U.S. Senate, 
Uh, it was one of the most lovely uh, expressions of the best of the American ideal that I've seen, you know, certainly since John Lewis, maybe since Dr. King, um, President Obama, um, Robert Kennedy. Uh, these were people who, who understood um, Jimmy Carter, I would add to that list, who understood the best of who we can be. So that's the debate. That's the thing that's still going on. And it has an educational piece. It has a political piece with voter suppression laws and, and um, all of those kind of things. And I think there's an economic piece that threads its way through it also. But mostly, not mostly, but in addition to all of that, the thing that undergirds it is politicians who are willing to appeal to bitterness instead of our better angels, who are willing to nurse and exaggerate old grievances instead of uh, talking about what we share. And you can talk to people about what we share, uh, but we just need people to do it. And that was a bipartisan realization for a long time. And I fear that it's become less so. I mean, as a liberal guy like I am, I will tell you that I was very happy when former President George W. Bush came to Atlanta to speak at the funeral of John Lewis. Um, he and John Lewis disagreed on many things, but President Bush was proud of the fact that he had signed an extension of the Voting Rights Act that had passed overwhelmingly in the U.S. Congress, and now it can't. Um, so, you know, which is going to prevail? Which of these qualities of character, uh, these historical forces, these political forces, is going to prevail? Should I spoil the ending? <laughs> um, the answer, of course, is we don't know. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. For, we're happy we, to uh, but we believe very strongly that it depends on what American citizens, the people in this room, decide to do. Um, Fry likes to say that we wrote this book both as a warning um, and to show glimmers of hope as inspiration. I think one of the things that concerns me is I am not sure how seriously people take the subtitle of our book. A Story of Democracy and the Balance. I really do believe, we both do, that the nation is at another crossroads, another turning point. We have been at these historically before. The Civil War was one of those. Uh, but so was the post-Reconstruction period, when um, everything went in the wrong direction. Then there was the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and notice uh, the huge part that the South plays in all of those. I believe, and I think that there are many historians who would agree with me, that the United States was not really a democracy until the Civil Rights Movement. When black citizens were uh, allowed to vote after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, without intimidation. It was after that that so many um, Native Americans and Latinos came to understand that they too had the right to vote in this country, that they too were equal citizens. And of course, the Civil Rights Movement spawned other movements for full equality, the women's movement, the gay rights movement followed as other people who were marginalized came to realize that they too had every right to claim full citizenship. As I look at things, um, as a black woman, it seems to me that the nation was better off 
for all of those movements. And I'm not just speaking in a political sense. The South was much better off economically after the end of Jim Crow. Because then major companies felt, OK, we can go there. It's OK if we set a flag down you know, in Georgia, in Alabama, in Mississippi. Everybody prospered. So I suppose one of the questions that I would like for more white citizens, particularly white conservatives, to ask themselves is, how were you hurt personally <laughs> by uh, black people and brown people and gay people and transgender people gaining full citizenship? I don't see that anybody was hurt by that. It looks, seems to me, again, that we were all better off. But it may be, as Isabel Wilkerson argues brilliantly in Cast, that there are many whites who believe they are harmed if they lose cultural and political influence. At the very end of the book, we use a quote uh, from Taylor Branch um, that Isabel got from him in her book, Cast. Um, I don't want to ruin the quote, for you probably know it better than I do. Well, I Isabel Wilkerson and Taylor Branch were, um, were having a conversation um, about the backlash against, uh, pre against President Obama. And they weren't talking about disagreement with presidential policies. I mean, all presidents have to decide, and to decide is to divide. And so there are always going to be controversies and political debates about policy. That's as it should be. But the birtherism and the, uh, the, the willingness to believe that uh, the president of the United States was a Muslim or whatever, the kind of nonsensical things, the fact that somebody uh, took a shot at the, the presidential bedroom of the White House while the Obamas were in it. Uh, that person is in prison now. But um, that those kind of things um, were, um, were indicative of something dark and resurgent in the country. And so Wilkerson and Branch were talking about this. And Branch said, do you suppose that this country, once again, uh, will choose whiteness over democracy. And he argued that that had happened, uh, in fact, at the end of Reconstruction. Um, and so the question was then hanging, uh, is it going to happen again? Um, and, um, and it could. I mean, it really could. There are, there are serious efforts underway uh, to, um, to just overturn elections or make it harder for people to vote or whatever. Elections were overturned, by the way, in the post-Reconstruction era. So there really is precedent uh, for that in the history of the country. But surely, surely most Americans of all colors know, if you think about it, that multicultural, that, that this country is multicultural, that it is multiracial, that is not going to change. That is absolutely baked in to the realities of life in this country. Since that's the case, what kind of country do we want it to be? Do we want to understand each other and try to get along and be able to come together to deal with complicated problems and have to relearn the art of compromise and creative disagreement and all of those things that are not easy, but we better, right? I mean, it's just, it's just horrifying and stupid to think of the kind of place this will be 
uh, if we think it's the if we think it's for the best to just throw rocks and shoot e each other, mostly metaphorically, but not altogether. So I mean, we really are, I think, coming to those kind of stark choices and. You know, as Cynthia is fond of saying, she and I on our better days uh, have faith in the better angels, uh, but then we have other days too. Um, one last thing I wanna say, and then maybe it'll be time to open it up for questions. I see Claire back there with note cards. Uh, and, and yeah, that will be good to get your thoughts in response to ours. Um, but, Dr. King uh, used to say, and it was one of my favorite quotes, the uh, he, he, first time I'm aware of him saying it was after the Selma to Montgomery March, and he said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that was kind of an article of faith that many of us held for a long time, that, that there was sort of this inevitable arc toward justice and progress in the country. Uh, but now I think there's a real question about whether it's an arc or whether it's a pendulum. And I think we have to try to answer that. All right. Thank you so much. And I will come along and get your... <laughs> I have one question to get us started, and then if you have one, just hold it up, I'll come and get it. If you need a note card, let me know. Okay, the question is directed at Fry, but it's for both of you. I think it uh, tags on really nicely to what you were saying. The book cover mentions some quote-unquote positive outlook, but I had trouble finding it, said Wyatt. <laughs> Do you have a response to that? Well, you know, there is a lot that's that's certainly not positive in there. There are, there are anecdotes though that we that we talk about uh, that have to do with uh, with reconciliation um, and understanding going back uh, a, a ways. I mean, for example, um, there's the story in the book of George Wallace speaking at Martin Luther King's church in Montgomery in 1978. Um, and getting a standing ovation after he told the people uh, in the church that after being shot on a campaign stop in Maryland, he finally understood the nature of suffering. And he understood that it could be redemptive and he hoped it would be redemptive for him. And he asked for forgiveness for the things that he had done to make the lives of African-American people worse. Some people were pretty cynical about Wallace and thought maybe he had just learned to count and black people could now vote and so he wanted their votes. Um, but John Lewis was not cynical about Wallace. John Lewis went and spent time with Wallace and said, and we have this in the book too, it was almost like somebody confessing to a priest. You know, we talk about uh, Jimmy Carter and the things he said and then in the end of the book, uh, we talk about the elections in Georgia um, in 2020 um, and the extraordinary hopefulness that uh, those contain as an example for the rest of the country. Because um, not only did Joe Biden beat Donald Trump in Georgia, which Cynthia and I both think was a good thing, um, but in addition to that, uh, you know, you had these two Senate candidates campaigning together, reaching across those old divides, rekindling old alliances. You know, John Ossoff uh, took the oath of office on a Bible that had been in the Jewish temple that was bombed here in Atlanta in the 1950s. I mean, those kind of symbols, hopeful symbols of the past, not the bombing, but the preservation of that artifact from a time that the rabbi in that temple uh, took heroic stands for justice. Those are the hopeful signs that we talk about in the book. But whoever asked the question is right. There's a lot of, uh, there's a whole chapter on that we call the golden escalator, which is about uh, the candidate who came down a golden escalator in 2015 in, um, uh, and immediately painted a whole race of people with the uh, 
epithet that they were racists. Um, I mean, he conceded, as he sometimes does, to muddy the issue. Uh, some are good people, I assume, but it was a throwaway, afterthought kind of line to put the, racist, the rapist in perspective. Well, all of that is, is hard to find much, for me, much hope in that. Um, when, you, when, when you magnify grievances and, on purpose instead of trying to heal them, um, it's such a disservice to the country that, you know, to me, it, it becomes unpatriotic. Why, why would you do that if you love the country? But that's just me. Next question is, could you explain the Fairness Doctrine of 1949, and if it were still in effect today, how it would uh, serve the public interest? Yes, she. Um, President Biden recently, and I'm going to mangle the quote, so I will just say he suggested, this is not exactly what he said. Something to the effect that Fox News is one of the worst influences um, on the nation at the moment. I happen to agree with him 110%. Uh, the fairness doctrine was created way back in the day before streaming services and cable news when the broadcast waves were regulated by the government. So the government could require the big three legacy uh, broadcast networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, to air uh, public interest programming. And they were required to um, air in, uh, issues that some citizens might rec um, consider controversial and to give equal time to both sides of an issue. That meant that uh, people were, and let's face it, people didn't have nearly as many distractions as they do today, many other things to do. And so many Americans were sitting in front of the television watching this public interest programming. I believe that that meant that people were better informed about current events. Fast forward to the 1980s when Reagan and a group of conservative Republicans wanted to get rid of the Fairness Doctrine. I don't know why, uh, but uh, a comedian at the time said, it's because the facts have a liberal bias. <laughs> when the Fairness Doctrine was eliminated, that opened the door, not just for Fox News, but for people like Rush Limbaugh who had absolutely not only no interest in fairness, but no interest in facts. So what so many people are exposed to today, if Fox News were simply airing the conservative point of view all the time, that wouldn't be nearly so dangerous. But what so many of these talk show hosts radio and TV and internet are doing these days is simply airing lies, uh, telling people that ivermectin cures COVID, telling people that uh, Putin is in fact uh, in Ukraine to get rid of Nazis. Um, so it isn't just a, a war on the liberal point of view it is a war on facts. And I think that that is one of the most dangerous things uh, confronting a democracy. You know, every time I read that the Russian people are subjected every day to this utter nonsense about the war in Ukraine, I sit there and I think, how could they believe that? And then I remember that there are a substantial minority of Americans who are subjected to perhaps not the same nonsense, but a similar stream of absolute utter nonsense, uh, stuff that isn't true, and they believe it. Another question? 
Another question about the role of the media in all of this. Um, can you talk about the role of televangelists and large evangelical congregations and the support of the culture war and um, how you see those the issues that you talk about going uh, with these? There's a great chapter in the book on it. Yeah. Well, you wrote most of that chapter. It's my chapter, so. I'll go for it. I have long been, since my childhood, um, I have been fascinated by um, the Christian right. Um, Dr. King called them out in his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. And I grew up with knowing that there were these people who called themselves Christians but who didn't believe that I should sit next to their children in a classroom or that my family should sit down to eat in a restaurant. Over the years, I've watched, I watched as it seemed that the Christian right was at least coming to terms with what I believe is the actual gospel of Jesus, um, at least on the subject of race. In the 1990s, the Southern Baptist Convention finally got around to apologizing for slavery, a little late, but better late than never. And they began to reach out to uh, black members and to black churches to have them come under the umbrella of the Southern Baptist Convention. Their theology is not mine, but I thought that was a step in the right direction. Then Donald Trump got elected with the enthusiastic support of so many conservative white Christians. And their black members noticed. Uh, and many of them began to leave those churches. Now, this may not sound like a positive note, but I see it as one many white members began to leave those churches as well. The membership in what are called evangelical churches, although I believe that to be a misnomer, um, I think of them as uh, fundamentalist in nature. Uh, the membership in those churches is in decline. As many of their white members too wondered why they could enthusiastically embrace a, a sexist, racist, um, adulterer uh, who bragged about um, grabbing women. So um, I believe now, having said all that, many of the most influential politicians are still members of conservative Christian churches. Um, Ted Cruz's, uh, Mike McConnell. Pence's, uh, McConnell is. So those churches, which have their largest membership in the South, uh, are still very influential on the political scene nationally. But I am heartened by the fact that many of their members, uh, including some who were higher up in church organizations, have decided to walk away. One quick footnote to that, that uh, and I don't know if this will make sense or not, but one of the things that I worry about in terms of the influence of fundamentalist churches too is not just the content of their theology and doctrine and and political agenda and all of that, but the habit of thinking that says, I'm totally right and you are totally wrong and, and not only totally wrong, but, but probably evil if you disagree with me. And you know, as one conservative minister that I talked to admitted, he said, you know, uh, that kind of Doctrine may be the lifeblood of conservative theology, but it's the death knell of politics. Um, I mean, we can't look at each other in that kind of way that says we have nothing to say to each other. Now, there are times that we really don't. I understand that. And there are people that you just can't talk to. 
And as I'm fond of saying, uh, all we can do is kind of bear witness. Uh, but we have to signal somehow a willingness to, to, to listen that we've let go of, and the churches haven't helped in that regard. We're getting close to the end of our time here tonight, but we have several great questions remaining, and none of them are at all related to one another, so I'm going to we'll, we'll <laughs> go be through them. We'll be shorter. I'll be shorter. In Rap, rapid fire. So this one, um, is, it says, you said a true democracy in the United States was not until, in effect until 1965, but do you think a democracy is possible in a country that does not recognize the sovereignty of indigenous people? So as that uh, controversy continues, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, the question about indigenous people is, is a fascinating one. Um, you know the history. I don't have to um, go over it with you. I will say that I think it is interesting that so many indigenous people are now able to enact their own laws, uh, not necessarily on land they want to be on, uh, but on the land where they find themselves. How that will eventually play out, I don't know. But I also know that Native Americans are uh, voting in larger numbers in places like Arizona, uh, New Mexico, throughout the West. Um, and I think that is a very good thing. Thank you. This one's an interesting one. Um, do you believe that most white Southerners would agree that being on the losing side of the Civil War was, in retrospect, a good outcome, or just Southerners in general? Right. <laughs> you know, speaking for all white guys in the <laughs> um, you know, the, I mean, what a, you know, the, the, the good thing that happened in the Civil War was that the South lost and slavery ended. Um, and surely, 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 uh, my fellow white guys agree with me that it's better that slavery ended. Uh, problem is racism didn't. And, um, and there have been emanating from the South ever since then the attempts to sometimes underground, sometimes above ground, to keep the, the racist, the racial assumptions that you had to believe in if you were going to own other human beings. Um, that one is, a, is fundamentally better than the other. I mean, that sense of white privilege, that sense of whites being better, um, did not die with the end of the Civil War. And the tragedy of that is that the suffering in that war was staggering, uh, and particularly in the South. I mean, 622,000 soldiers died on American soil in that war, and, and a majority of them were, most of them died on southern soil, but the majority of those were southern. Uh, and so we ought to get something better out of it than just not owning other people anymore. But whether most white people agree with that, I don't know. I've never had anybody disagree when I've said that in talks, but whether it's framed that way very often, I don't know. Let, let, let me say that when I, what I hear uh, from people in public conversation is we all agree slavery was horrible. Um, I have, the most conservative whites are willing to be on the record, slavery was an awful thing, never should have happened. What few are, of them are willing to come to terms with, as Fry said, was the aftermath. What happened after that? Uh, the things that we still haven't dealt with. Uh, the history that we're now still fighting over. I have several more questions that are asking you both to put on your predicting the future hats. So I won't put that on to you too much because I know, you know, as you say in the book, you don't know how it's going to end but up. But I do hope 
you Georgians do the right thing. Let me just put that out there. We're depending yeah. on you. Right. Just a couple of final questions. They'll kind of roll into one. But this one um, talks about the election in Georgia specifically. And since y'all devote a chapter to that, I thought we could talk about this one. And then at the end, I'd love to hear how y'all ended up writing a book together, because we didn't get to talk about that as much sure. tonight. Um, but this question says, um, you know, down ballot candidates like Ossoff, do you think that they benefited from Trump um, during his early, due to his early handling of the COVID pandemic, um, particularly in Georgia? And they also would like you to tell us how we're to remain hopeful when Jody Heiss is likely to run for Secretary of State in Georgia. So. That, I think that's just getting at the elections in Georgia coming up. Do you have any thoughts about that? Let me, um, in very gen general terms, let me say what I think, which is probably wrong. Because you're looking at a person who never thought Trump would be elected. I was one of the many pundits who thought, oh, no. First, I thought he wouldn't win the Republican nomination. Um, and then I certainly didn't think he'd win the presidency. Having said all that, let me say that um, he was a bad enough president uh, that the majority of voters were ready to get rid of him. Um, but not as many Democratic candidates benefited from that as I would have thought. If you remember, there wasn't this blue wave that we thought there would be. and. Um, on my uh, pessimistic days that Fry referred to, I remember Trump got more votes the second time than he got the first time. Happily, Joe Biden got more, but Trump got more votes in 2020 than he got in 2016. Jody Heiss. Jody Heiss is one of many Trumpists running for office all over the country people who have bought into the big lie. That now includes, by the way, the governor of Georgia. Uh, Kay Ivey started out as a relatively sane conservative Republican. Yeah, governor of Alabama. Did I say Georgia? Yeah. I am. You all have a, uh, somebody becoming increasingly Trumpist, too. But I meant <laughs> the governor of Alabama, Kay Ivey. Uh, in her most recent ads, has endorsed the big lie. She has said, everybody knows that uh, Joe Biden stole the election. Around the country, there are people, because the big lie has become a foundational truth of the Republican Party, around the country there are people running for various offices who have explicitly endorsed the big lie. The scariest places for them to be are close to the election machinery. So please, uh, Georgians, we're depending on you <laughs> to keep that from happening here. You want us to talk about the writing of the book together, or do you want, you have another question for us? We're not going to be able to get to everyone's great questions, but could you just tell us a little bit about how you both came together to write this book, and we can end on that, and then afterwards, we will meet you out in the lobby for a signing, so if you haven't yet had your book signed or you'd like it personalized, we'll see you out in the lobby. Do you want me to start with that? Yes, please. Well, as Cynthia <coughs> said, um, we were asked to write this book by our editor at New South Books, uh, he reached out to me first, and I said, let's include Cynthia in the process. Uh, I wanted to do that um, for a couple of reasons. One is it never hurts to tag along with the winner of a Pulitzer Prize, I thought. Um, but beyond my own narrow self-interest, what I thought was that it's, um, that having a, uh, having a book about this topic written by an African-American Southerner and a white Southerner um, who basically agree on where we stand and how we got here. There may be nuances of difference that have to do with different racial perspectives, in fact, and yet, and yet they come together in um, 
a seamless way. And literally, there were no points of disagreement as we were writing the book. And it was easy uh, to collaborate um, on it. But we wanted to make that statement, you know, uh, a, a black voice and a white voice from the South talking about our better angels and them clinging to life, uh, but the threats that the opposite poses. I had gotten to know Fry um, first as a writer, later as a colleague. And what I knew is that he had spent years excavating his own family history. Um, he answered the question about the Civil War. What he did not say was that he can trace his heritage back to men who fought in the Civil War. And he has written about that um, and tried to come to terms with, in his writing, what it has meant that um, his family wealth was based on enslaving uh, black people. Um, I can't imagine what the process has been like for him personally, but he was so honest about it along the way. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind that this would be somebody I would enjoy writing a book with. Thank you.